Okay, uh, we are in not discernment, but dis, uh, disordered. Uh, we were uh, finishing up, we finished up three, I think, uh, chapter three, Appetite for Destruction, and we were in chapter four considering some of these uh, definitions uh, that, that he, is, he spoke about. And um, last class, we did spend a lot of time, too, on the, this idea of, uh, of mortal and venial sins and this idea that um, it is a recognition of the, uh, it's almost more a description of the, the person than the actual sin that's taking place, because we know all sins, of course, uh, are, are uh, rebellion against God. Um, but like when Jesus tells his disciples, when he institutes the office of the Holy Ministry, he says, you know, uh, he, Jesus breathed on the disciples. And does anybody remember that passage? He breathed on his disciples and said to them, whosoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. But whosoever sins you don't forgive, right, they are not forgiven. So even here, what we would call in the institution of the, the holy ministry part of this, uh, even here Jesus is saying, look, consider the person, right? Sins, right? There's no different word for sins in both of these verses when Jesus says this. There are some sins that you forgive and there are some sins that you will be tasked with that you are to say you are not forgiven. And it could be the case, right? We think about it's a, little, it's, a, it's a little different, but think about uh, what did Peter do to our Lord? He denied him. You know, he denied Christ, and, and Jesus restored him. Uh, Judas, then, of course, he denied or betrayed Christ, and yet he did not believe. He did not have faith. So, you know, w one person, and, and this also, too, is interesting because it, it kind of relates, maybe. I, I didn't haven't thought over this much, it just kind of dawned on me, that the reason that Cain was so angry, right? Do you remember why Cain was angry, why he murdered his brother? Because he gave a sacrifice. And mm -hmm. They both gave a sacrifice, didn't they? But his wasn't, his wasn't out of faith. His was out of right. duty. Right. They both gave a sacrifice. God accepted one, but not the other. The other, Cain's, was a sin, his sacrifice, because it wasn't with faith. So this is why Cain was so angry. He says, Abel, why, why is his sacrifice accepted? We're the same. We're the same. Or some people saying, why, does, why is that sin forgiven but not mine? I did the same thing. Well, it's faith. So, uh, and that, that's all I wanted to kind of tail in on that discussion and not delve, you know, discuss it too much more. If you have questions, come to me uh, and we can discuss it. Um, but it is this recognition which the author said was helpful for him, right, in his Christian walk uh, about um, sins uh, that he committed and uh, receiving the gospel as comfort and forgiveness. Uh, so, uh, just wanted to, to tie that up a little bit and then um, move on um, to, um, oh yeah, we'll have another discussion of uh, another word that's, that's misused. Uh, chapter 4, uh, selfie, uh, begins the discussion of the black mirror, right? This wonderful black mirror that uh, I am trying to enslave and use for good. Uh, and, and the, the proclamation of the gospel and good. Okay, so as we uh, reflect on the questions on page 77, um, anything in particular, oh, I, I have to brag, that came up in my social media feed. Yeah, do y'all remember that little girl? She would, she would murder me if she knew I was doing this. She was very smart. We can, we can call her. <laughs> Look at, look, at what this, look at what this says, 12 years ago. Oh, I thought it was yesterday. I thought it was yesterday. Yeah, so uh, she's doing good. I uh, appreciate everybody asking and, and how she's doing. She's settling well there in Tyler and uh, enjoying the, the university there. So, okay, um, in what ways, or first, let's, well, I'll ask if there were anything in chapter four that Anybody thought was worth mentioning or uh, examining? Nick. 
that you thought was good in the, in the book, in that chapter, chapter four, selfie. Any outlines or anything? Anything lined? Um, this is on page 70. This is an interesting, an interesting thing to contemplate and think about. The, past, the paragraph that starts with the title, Worship My Face. Uh, this is, yeah, yeah, this is interesting. And if, if you look at this word face, even in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the face of God or the face of a person, even going back to Cain and Abel, God comes to Cain and says, Cain, why is your face drawn down? Why is your face downward? Um, and it was, you know, because he was, he was stewing in his anger and his sin. Um, so worship my face. Uh, he, he takes this to worship, right? He talks about different worship and images and icons and being in a, in a, in a Byzantine, he used that word on page 70, Byzantine style churches, right? Typically have worship surrounded by things that the idea is to take the worshiper uh, surrounded and to remind him of that passage in Hebrews, that when we're in church, we are surrounded by the cloud of witnesses, that when we are in church, the book of Hebrews tells us that you come to a mountain, you are surrounded by saints, angels, and archangels, and all the hosts of heaven, that the most people in church, right, there's no such thing as a, what we call a low church Sunday. There's no such thing as a Sunday service where the pews are not packed or the room is not packed. Hebrews says when you come to worship, um, you don't see what's going on. Like St. Paul says in our spiritual battles, there's spiritual battles all around us. Well, uh, along these lines, the book of Hebrews teaches us and says when you come to worship, you come to a mountain that cannot be touched, yet you still come into the presence of our God who's a consuming fire. Like in the book of Exodus, when God tells Moses to come up and to get the Ten Commandments and how it was thundering and lightning. And if anybody would touch the mountain, they would die. If anyone would come into the presence of God, they would die without God telling them, you come. Right? Because God then told uh, Moses, and some of the, uh, and, and Aaron, or Moses and some of the elders at different times to come up on the mountain. When God invites you, right? And I think I've talked about this a little bit. Remember, God told Moses and all the people, he said, if anybody touches this mountain, they will die, man, beast. All right, Moses, come up on the mountain. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Imagine that. So this is kind of, uh, this is kind of the same thing. What, why was Cain's offering not accepted in the presence of God because he didn't have faith? Moses had to trust what God said to him, Moses, yeah, come up to the mountain. He had to take that, I mean, can you imagine taking that first step onto that mountain, just being like, oh God, please. But God does not lie. And so he, so the book of Hebrews, this is along the lines of what uh, Pastor Esgit is, is talking about. Talking about worship and the things that are in worship. And there is an interesting word there on page 70. The word that I have come to realize is helpful for me. Have any of y'all heard the word venerated? It's in the middle of that paragraph on page 70. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Another word that can be misused, like all words. Venerated. He says this. The images or icons are venerated. The worshiper is thus mindful of Christ and the great cloud of witnesses in the saints. So, this word venerated, I thought was useful, beneficial, and worth looking at because it is misused, kind of like mortal and venial sins. That venerated is a word that the church uses to describe when you look at an image and it teaches you or it points you to Christ. Right? So, we see like this cross up here. We see this cross... But there's something further beyond the cross that we are being taught and pointed to, right? We're not, we're not being pointed to and taught. We're not being reminded of, oh, I don't know, of uh, popcorn, 
right? We're being reminded and taught of Christ. And so we, we see the cross and we venerate it, which means we don't worship the cross, but we worship what the cross represents. We venerate, or even in the Old Testament, if you wonder, well, is this word even, why would we say and do that? Well, if you remember in the Old Testament, there was a story of the bronze serpent. You remember this? And Moses put the bronze serpent up on the staff and the people were to look at it. Same thing, to look at it in faith. Because what did the bronze serpent, what was it connected to? Why was looking at the bronze serpent, why did it heal the people? Okay, it's, it healed them from the snake, the venomous bites. Why did it heal them? Because they trusted in faith God's promise. He attached his promise to the snake and said, look at the snake. Right? And you will be healed. You'll be not just healed, you'll be saved from death. And so then they kept that bronze serpent, they put it in the Ark of the Covenant, they carried it with them, and they had it along until the people started to worship the snake, until the bronze serpent. They started to worship that and use it kind of like a good luck charm. And the Israelites, they do this all the time. Even with the Ark of the Covenant, if you're in the Tuesday afternoon Bible study, you know, we've talked about this, where the Israelites, they had the Ark of the Covenant that they were traveling with through the Promised Land and all around, and, and they said, let's take the Ark of the Covenant and let's go battle this nation. But they didn't pray to God first. They didn't ask God if they should go battle this nation. They took the Ark of the Covenant and assumed God's going to agree with all of our great ideas. So they took the Ark of the Covenant and it became like a rabbit's foot, like a good luck charm. They began to worship the bronze snake, the Ark of the Covenant. And so they took that Ark of the Covenant and they went to battle. And what do you think happened? They lost. They got creamed. Yes, they got decimated. And, and they didn't go to the priest. They didn't go to anybody to ask if it actually is God's will that they go to battle. They just said, hey, God's on our side. Let's, yeehaw, let's go, right? Well, we wouldn't do that today, would we? <laughs> right? God agrees with me. Woo, let's go and do this, right? And a lot of times that leads to a sin, and uh, then that it's going to snowball. So we do this in politics a lot, right? Uh, in, in the United States, we think the United States is, is whatever we decide, God's going to approve, right? But that's, that's not the case. So this point in the using this word venerated is it helps us to have a sort of a word or it helps me to have a framework that I can see a cross in church. I can see a crucifix. I can see a pastor and say, oh, what is he up there for? What is he doing? What's his job? And we can venerate things recognizing that Okay, but we're not crossing that line of what? Worshiping him. Right? So this is why churches and why even God in the Old Testament and, and teaching Solomon on how to build the temple. There's all kinds of imagery on the temple. There's gold, right? Even gold itself is, is something to be venerated in a sense, but not worshipped. Why did God have everything in the temple lined with gold? No, why not? <laughs> I like the way you think. Let's, let's do that in our sanctuary. Um, with all the, why, why do you think? Everyone had to give it up. I mean, right, yeah. No. So it was. It didn't just come out of thin air. The members had to give it. And then they got it from conquering. Other nations. Yep, yep. It's beautiful. Okay, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Why wouldn't you want the temple of the one true God to reflect beauty if he is truth goodness and beauty if he is dwelling there exactly. yep if his presence so uh you know and this is a this has been a a, a point of contention even within I the reformation right because there were the radical reformers who said no you're worshiping the cross you're worshiping crucifixes you're worshiping stained glass right they they became they took it too far they became known as what we would kind of characterize, we would call them iconoclasts. They see icons and they want to destroy them. Now right. churches look like warehouses. 
Yes, and that's, that's the point of this paragraph and this chapter and talking about this and saying, look, just because something has been abused, if we know words, if we kind of know vocabulary, like venerating something, then we can know, we use that word knowing that there's a line that we must not cross because then we become like the Israelites who just, who just think that the cross, right, that you see it on TV with musicians, right, pop musicians, what are they wearing around their neck? A cross, but what are they singing about? What are their lives? What kind of lives are they leading, right? Or, or the, the politician, right, going to the, going to the church service, right, <laughs> and, and going to church, you know, and, and saying, you know, these sorts of things. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it becomes, we have to be careful. It doesn't become a, a, uh, a tool to please the flesh or uh, something that teaches us contrary to what the scriptures say. Right. Okay, yes, yeah, Sarah. Um, venerable, which is kind of the same, you know, the same Greek word as veneration means to like we demand respect, like the venerable Mr. Otmers. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's kind of like, you know, venerating, you know, when you go into these big, you know, Byzantine churches or, you know, other, even some Lutheran churches that have a lot of art and stained glass, you know, you walk in and, you know, it commands, like, you know, it's something to be respected, like, you know, it's sort of... No. How, how, yeah, how about, should kids venerate their parents? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because what do, what do parents teach you? Who are your parents? Okay. They, are God's rep- they are God's appointed representative to you, right? So, you know, and, and that's why I think this word is helpful when we, we use and we see this word. Now, you're going to be looked at weird if, people, if you use the word venerate, you know, but that's okay. Um, but what it does help is it says, look, you know, just as God used in the Old Testament, and even, even you can see in the New Testament, right, uh, Jesus, he, he, um, he saw uh, the temple, right? He said, look, the, the temple, the dwelling place of God, right, that was only meant to teach you about what I'm going to do. Jesus said, what's he going to do to the temple, the sanctuary of God? I'm going to tear it down in three days, build it back. Jesus said, look at the temple and appreciate it. Jesus told the lepers, he told them, go back to the priest so he can declare you clean. Um, there is, there is um, the warning always there, though. And when we use the word venerate, we know what it means. That helps us in our mind and in our discipline to make sure and say, okay, what would it look like if I'm worshiping this? And for us in our own personal lives, how do you know, let's take, it, let's take out religious veneration, um, in your life, in your daily life, the things you have or the reputation you have, or things like that. How do you know if you've begun to worship something? Because it's more important to you. Okay, it becomes more important than your faith. How does that look on a practical level? What happens then, uh, you're driving your Ferrari around, sorry Bob to expose you. Um, You're driving your Ferrari around and somebody runs into it. It's only a lease. (laughs) 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 Somebody runs into it or or somebody does just a <laughs> here we go. Somebody does just a venial sin against you, yeah. right? Someone unintentionally sins against you, and and they they run into your car, or they step on your toes, or they say something about your kid, or they say something about whatever it is that you are venerating or going beyond venerating. How do we know if we're worshiping something? We get angry when it gets taken away or when someone threatens our throne. It's just flying off the handle, right? That's how you know if you're going beyond venerating, right? Uh, We are told to take all things, uh, take all things captive to Christ, right? All things. Um, But when, when do we stop, right? And, and uh, that's what we, that's what this word, and he used it in here, just throwing it off, and he, he defined it then, right? Mindful of Christ and the great cloud of witnesses 
in the saints. So then he builds that up and he says, and this is part of the reason, right? Not understanding this distinction or this word venerate, recognizing that you can have something beautiful and it can be used in service of the gospel. The iconoclasts or people who wanted to just get rid of everything historical, which sounds like Marxism, get rid of everything historical in the church and we're going to start with something new. We're going to have new traditions. We're going to have new images. We're going to have new messages. It, it, we're going to get rid of everything and we're going to have our own images. And that's what he says here. He says, yeah, once you move away from that, yeah, you can use whatever images you want in the church. It's not commanded by God. But when you do use other images, what are you saying? What are you teaching? What is it that you are pointing to? And he makes the point, I think, very astutely and very good that modern churches that feature a stage with large screens or performers who are the focal point, if icons and Christ and pictures of him and biblical imagery remind you of being surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, things you don't see, what is it that the modern church is pointing you toward? Maybe world, maybe, and, and I, I'd say we want to we give them benefit of the doubt, but looking at those things, what are the images that they bring forth? What are the images that they, that they use? Okay, that, that's his point in this, in this, in this selfie, in this chapter. Um, him uh, attending another, another local church in Washington, D.C., and kind of speaking of that. Uh, and uh, he talks about that the pastor in particular, the preacher, is supposed to point you to Christ. That's one of the reasons why we have vestments. That's why we wear collars. That's why we have things in the church. It's intended to use some sort of biblical imagery to point you to Christ. But if that is tossed aside and thrown aside, um, he makes the point and says, you know, when it's just the image of a pastor detached from the people, he says, there was a pastor at this church, he did the sermon through a screen. A pastor detached from the people, mediated through screens, is a substantial, I'm reading on page 72, is a substantial change from the church's incarnational ministry, which is centered on human interaction with in-person words and hands that absolve and bless, wash with water, and make personal distribution of sacred food. So he talks about this idea that um, a disordered desire, that of being a celebrity, narcissistic, black mirror, that when you're staring at the phone, it's teaching you to love yourself. That's why it's so addictive. It's the, and the, the physical right side of this, the chemical, the dopamine hits that, that it provides. He says, this is a disordered desire um, and churches should appeal to teach us using symbols and art to point us away from ourselves. And that's part of me wearing robes on Sunday is I don't look like you, right? Oh. Yeah, thanks be to God. I was going to say, thanks be to God, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't look like you. I don't dress like you because part of my job is to say, you're hearing the words of Christ. It's as if Christ is standing here among you. And um, not that you necessarily have to, right? But you have to ask the question, why, why not? Why change or what ways can we use to support the gospel? Okay. Any thoughts or questions on that? I know I, I said a lot. Um, if you're focused on that screen, and I've been in churches that do that, you're focused on the screen. You're not focused on the altar at all. If you're totally, there is an altar. If there is an altar. But even yeah. if there is an altar, you know, you, you are focused. Yeah. I'm looking at the hymn on the screen yeah. or the pastor yeah. on the screen. Well, and we have, to, we have to be, yeah, and we want, we want to be careful. We want to respect and say, you know, is that the fault of the screen or the user? The user. Yeah, yeah. Just like any anything else, right? It can be misused, can be used rightly. He he takes it, takes this point, and leads it, and he says, you know, this leads to this temptation within our, our disordered fallen flesh, for the the everything to be about the personality of the pastor, or to be about 
the personality of the church as something apart from Christ. Um, he, he writes this, or, or this is one of the things he says. Um, the answer to celebrity pastors, right, or have you ever considered how robes and pulpit take away from the man? The answer to celebrity pastors, meaning robes and pulpit, that, that makes me disappear. The more I disappear, the better. The answer to misusing this and having celebrity pastors is not to seek pastors who are cold, distant, and unrelatable. But what is the correct balance between desiring a talented preacher and making too much of him? Ideally, people are not drawn to the church because of the man, but to the one whom he works for, Jesus. There are many ways pastors can carry themselves that draws too much attention on themselves and not Christ. At any rate, all Christians face this temptation that we, right, that we as Christians, we are holy. We are set apart. You represent Christ. So people should venerate you. <laughs> you should make yourself, maybe that's our nicknames, right? Venerable. There was a church father called the Venerable Bede. I don't remember much about him, but I always thought it was a funny name. So we are, ven you are venerable. You are to be venerated. You are yourself to know that you represent Christ. So you are a work of art. Right? You are beautiful. You are, you are um, what does God say? You are knit together in the womb of your mother. You are not trash. You are holy and righteous in God's eyes. Uh, his, his treasure. Okay, so that, that I thought was, was good and, and worthwhile to consider and mention, that social media, right, distracts us. It feeds narcissism, right? He tells a little story about narcissism, uh, narcissus. Um, verse 3, you guys tell me, what should my goal be in preaching and worship? Christ crucified. Yeah? Now, where did you get that from? <laughs> you read it on a fortune cookie? <laughs> yeah. St. Paul said, when I came to you, I did not bring to you lofty wisdom or great words, but I came to you and preached Christ and him crucified. Okay, good. Right? The pastor's goal in preaching and worship should be pointing us to Christ crucified. What else? Uh, kill you with the law, but then raise you back up with the gospel. <laughs> Jesus said to his disciples when he was ascending, when he was leaving, he said, go into all the world beginning in Jerusalem, preaching repentance and forgiveness of sins in my name. Preach repentance, the law, and forgiveness, the gospel. Okay, good. Taking this from, from the scriptures, very good. The goal in preaching and worship. Anything else? You guys are making it very easy on me. No. That's all I got to do? <laughs> Man. You have to also, in a sense, interact with your congregation. Okay. Yep. Yep. Be alive. Yeah. Yep. Jesus said to Peter, go, they tell us this at seminary. I don't know if you've heard this yet, Grant. Our Lord said to Peter, feed my sheep, not kick my dogs. Oh, yeah. You give us the gifts that Christ has. Yep. Yep. Feed. So, yeah, sacrament. Okay, all right. Um, oh, then this great definition. He takes us to this Greek word, hedoni, or he hedonism, right? And he, he lined out a couple of places, right, where uh, hedonism uh, is used in the scriptures, right? Look at this on page uh, 72 and 73. If you look on, uh, on 73, um, he's talking about the, the self-care trend. Books with titles like, top of page 73, I love me more. <laughs> How to find happiness and success through self-love and love yourself. These reveal the widespread acceptance of an ethic that turns the scriptures, two great commandments on their head. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Matthew 22. Okay, so then you go another paragraph or two down and look. 
he introduces us to this Greek word hedoni, the Greek word for pleasure. Okay, now look, he's going to point us to where, where the scriptures use this word hedonism or hedoni. Uh, at the top of page 74, um, this is the word that Jesus uses in Luke 8 to describe the seed, the soil that receives the seed with great joy at first. And then what happens? The top of page 74, the seed grows up and then all of a sudden weeds choke out this, this, this seed that blossomed so quick and was so full of energy. And then it says, they are choked by the cares, riches, and hedonism of life. Luke 8, 14. The Apostle Paul also uses this word in Titus 3. We ourselves, top of page 74, we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and hedonism, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. And now here James is going to use this word hedonism in the middle of the page there. He says, what causes quarrels, fights among you? Is it not this, that your hedonism is at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend on your hedonism. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? It changes the verse a little bit when it hits your ears when you put that Greek word in there, doesn't it? I mean, that's that word hedonism. We hear that word and we think, oh, pretty controversial, right? Um, and I think that's pretty beneficial. I really appreciated that he brought that Greek out with these passages. Talking about disordered desire and, and hedonism, uh, the self-care, loving yourself, uh, self-pleasure, right, is the source, James says, of your arguing, your fighting. You love yourself more than God and your neighbor. So then, question, uh, is pleasure always bad? Are there times in history where people have kind of erred that, that, that far? Saying that any pleasure is bad? Yeah, yeah, how, how so? What do you think? Okay, well, that's the, that's the difficult. Yeah, they see pleasure can become a god, so we have, to, uh, we, have to, we have to avoid pleasure at all costs. No, right, yeah. Sometimes... The church, uh, sometimes people, even ourselves, right? Uh, usually it happens after we eat a big lemon meringue pie all by ourselves. So I've been told. Um, and you're, you're full of there and you're like, oh, man. I'm never eating a pie again, right? That was embarrassing. I'm not going to touch the pie. I'm going to... I should have shared it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why? This... I'm never... right. I'm never touching the pies again. In fact, I'm never touching another drop of sugar. Never, not flavoring, nothing, right? And it can go to the other side, right? This happened with, this happened in the, in the Reformation too with um, the, the priests and the, mono, you know, um, celibacy of priests, right? They, 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 they erred too far in saying, no, a priest has to be above the desire for pleasure has to be above any sort of seeking of pleasure. You have to beat yourself every day. Some people can do it. But remember, too, there, there's also a, a certain amount of pleasure gained from causing yourself to suffer. Um, so, right, no, not all pleasure is ungodly, is wicked. It is, how, how would you describe pleasure then? How would, how would you describe the rightly use of, how can we distinguish between godly and ungodly pleasure? Maybe taking pleasure. <laughs> yeah, sure it was. <laughs> Speaking of eating pies. <laughs> Maybe taking pleasure in our vocations, whether it's like pleasure as someone's spouse or pleasure in your motherhood or fatherhood. Yeah. 
And, and that, that godly pleasure will look different for, for different vocations, right? And, and I think that leads back to those four words that we used for love, right? That, that the Greeks understood that love looks different in your vocations. So they even had a different word for, for each of those. But yeah, godly pleasure. What does God's word say is godly pleasure? How do we reorder our disordered desires and, and for pleasure in particular? And um, pleasure, godly pleasure will look different for, for different Christians. We use our God-given wisdom. Um, you know, does, is my pleasure um, affecting uh, somebody else negatively? Right? That also is something we need to, to keep in mind. But chiefly, we go back to the Word of God um, to see uh, what that is. All right. Um, he talks a little bit also about uh, addiction. Uh, and how just telling somebody to try harder does not work. It can oftentimes lead to despair or pride, um, but indeed uh, takes quite a bit of prayer, of course, and treatment in many regards. Um, we talked about that a little bit uh, on 75, I think, yep, yeah. uh, and so that at the end of that chapter. All right, uh, hedonism leads to, of course, um, then uh, addiction, if you will, uh, and, and uh, not being able to turn away from things. Okay, uh, chapter 5 and uh, 6 is what we'll do then next week. Uh, any closing, any closing uh, thoughts, anything about these chapters? Uh, chapter 4, uh, that you thought was worth mentioning before we go on to five and six, hopefully next week. All right, keep up your reading. Um, take notes, line, underline things, um, bring back some, some observations that you've had, things that are good or bad, uh, and uh, let us close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that your Son, Jesus Christ, who is your, who is the image of the eternal God, uh, that he himself was not, uh, did not love himself, but gave himself up for us, that in giving his life, he defined love for us, showing us indeed that you are a God who loves and is merciful and kind. We ask that you would forgive us when we have let our hedonism um, push and pull us. We pray that you would teach us repentance by your Holy Spirit, uh, that we indeed may live lives that show people and point people to your love, your kindness, and your mercy. Yet also, Lord, give us strength to stand firm when necessary, to stand up for the weak and the forgotten, and to stand up for the truth of your word. Give us your Holy Spirit also for that dedication that we like would be ready to give our lives, even as John the Baptist was ready to give his life for the truth of your word. May we follow his example. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen.